Hello, I'm Dr. Derek Keats, a former professor of biology, and today we've moved on to the topic uh, responding to the environment in plants, and we're going to introduce plant hormones and talk about the general functions of auxins, gibberellins, and abscisic acid. Now, plants are all around us, and almost everything we eat, everything if we count indirectly, because of course the animals that we eat also depend on plants, and much of the clothes that we wear, and many of the things that make contemporary life, life possible, even the tires on our cars, they come from plants. Now, without plants we wouldn't exist on the earth, so if we really want to understand our world, we need to understand plants. Now, remember when we talked about the human endocrine system, we discussed our hormones and said they were, what, signal molecules. Now, remember, we used the analogy of the coach in the World Cup soccer, signaling the, the players, signaling the team. Well, plants also have hormones. They do. They have hormones, and they serve a similar signaling purpose, that is, sending signals out within the plant body. But in the case of plants, you'll have to imagine the signals without the coach. So plant hormones are signal molecules that are produced within the plant that regulate growth and development of the plant in some way. And that's plant hormones. Now we as mammals, we take our glands in our nervous system and our blood transport for granted. Unlike us and other uh, mammals, however, plants don't have glands that produce and secrete hormones. Instead, many of the cells within the plant body can produce and release hormones themselves. Now, plant hormones occur in extremely low concentrations but they're able to regulate cellular processes in targeted cells, either near the site of release or at some distance from the site of the release. So they move throughout the plant before they have their effect. Now, plant hormones determine a whole variety of things uh, within the plant. They affect seed growth, the time of flowering, they affect the sex of flowers, the formation of leaves, the senescence and the dropping of leaves, uh, the development and ripening of fruits, and even the longevity and death of the plant. They also affect the direction of growth, uh, for example, with tissue, which tissues grow upward and which grow downward. Now, since uh, they don't have a heart pumping blood, Hormones are transplant, uh, transported within the plant body using different methods. So if, if it's just something which is going to be secreted and used locally, then cytoplasmic streaming within cells or the slow diffusion of molecules between closely adjacent cells is adequate. For hormones that need to move over a longer distance, however, uh, in the phloem, they can move in the sieve tubes of the phloem and they can move upwards in the xylem. So if something is secreted in the roots, for example, and it needs to get up to the leaves, it can move up into the, in, uh, in the xylem. Now, there are three main groups of hormones that we will look at in this video. Auxins, gibberellins, and abscisic acid. There are others as well, and one that you might hear quite a lot about is ethylene, which plays a role in the ripening of fruit and cytokinins. What we're going to do is we're going to start with auxins. Now, to look at auxins, one of the things that we can do is we can look at the, the things that the, the roles that they do, the roles that they pro provide in the plant. So they influence the enlargement of cells, the formation of buds, uh, the initiation of roots. They also play a role in promoting other hormones and together with another group of hormones called cytokinins, they control the growth of stems and roots and fruits and convert stems into flowers. Auxins also tend to be produced 
at the tip uh, of roots and shoots and one of the best ways to see what the influence of hormones are within plants is to look at the role of auxins and their influence on tropisms. Now tropisms um, represent a directional movement or growth response to a directional stimulus such as light or gravity or the availability of water. The stimulus is directional and the movement might be positive towards the stimulus or it might be negative away from the stimulus. Now there are three types of tropisms that we'll consider phototropism, geotropism, and hydrotropism. Now anyone who has ever grown plants near a window will have noticed that they lean towards the window, that they lean towards the light. So they lean towards the window where the light is stronger than the light inside the room. And this is called phototropism, the growth or movement that is determined by the direction of a light stimulus. Now growth towards a source of light is called positive phototropism and growth away from a source of light is called negative phototropism. The tips of shoots are usually positively phototropic while the tips of roots are negatively phototropic as we'll see later. Geotropism, also known as gravitropism, is a directional growth in response to gravity. This was first documented by Charles Darwin who was able to demonstrate that roots show positive uh, geotropism and stems show negative geotropism. Are we starting to see a relationship here? Yeah, I hope so. And then hydrotropism is growth or movement in the direction of water. So the stimuli are light, gravity, and water. Now let's look at phototropism first and the role played by auxins in, in uh, phototropism. So now when light is shining directly down on a shoot from above, uh, auxins are produced and they, and they diffuse downward equally all around the tip of the shoot. And so the plant just simply grows up. But what happens if the light is directional from the side? Uh, for example, a plant might be growing out of the side of something and then need to grow up towards the light. So phototropism is best demonstrated when the light shines from the side such as when a plant is in a window, as we have seen. Now, as uh, the light shines from the side, auxins are produced and they accumulate on the side away from the light. Now, as time passes, the tip of the shoot begins to, uh, begins to bend towards the light because the cells away from the light elongate more uh, than the cells that are on the side of the shoot towards uh, the light. So we can look at this in a diagram and you can see that uh, differential um, growth happens here but differential growth in tropisms mainly involve changes in cell elongation and not changes in cell division so we have greater cell elongation on one side of the plant than the other and this causes the shoot to turn towards the light and it's a relatively simple response and it is under the control of auxins. So as we have said, geotropism is a growth or movement in a direction that is determined by the Earth's gravity. It's sometimes called gravitropism. I don't like that word, so I'm going to stick with geotropism. Now imagine in my crude drawing here uh, that we have parts that represent the shoot and parts that represent a root. Now roots are positively geotropic and shoots are negatively geotropic. Can you imagine why? Shoots are positively phototropic and roots are negatively phototropic. What do you think this means? This helps ensure that the roots grow downward since they grow away from the light and towards gravity and shoots grow upward since they grow away from gravity and towards the light. And this is all under the control of auxin, but there is differential sensitivity to auxin between the roots and the shoot. Now, geotropism, just like phototropism, is a result of differential cell elongation. Okay, so that's enough for auxins right now. Okay, so let's look at gibberellins. Now the interesting thing about gibberellins is that 
Gibber Allen was first recognized in 1926 by the Japanese scientist by the name of Yichi Kurosawa, who was studying what was called foolish seedling, foolish seedling disease in rice. Now, here you have a rice paddy, and you can see that there is this very long plant vis visible. And this is the foolish seedling disease. The plant grows very long. Um, it has less chlorophyll, and it is uh, not going to be producing as much rice as we would uh, like it to. And so this disease seriously lowered the yield of rice crops in Japan, Taiwan, and other parts of Asia at the time. Now, Kurosawa found that the disease was caused by a fungus, which secretes a chemical that stimulates the elongation and it inhibits the formation of chlorophyll and suppresses the growth of roots. And all of this uh, reduced the yields of rice. Now, um, Kurosawa gave specimens of the fungus to a guy named uh, Tijero Yabuta, who extracted a compound that he named gibberellin, after the name of the fungus that produced it. Only later was it discovered that gibberellins were in fact plant hormones that the fungus was producing. Now, because they're plant hormones, they affect the plant in different ways. Now, gibberellins produce their effects by altering the transcription of genes. So let's review some of the functions of gibberellins as hormones in plants. We're not going to go into how this transcription happens, but gibberellins stimulate stem elongation. That's how the, what was it called, foolish seedling disease in rice came about, the elongation of the stem. And it does this by stimulating cell division and cell elongation. It also stimulates the flowering of plants, particularly long day plants, in response to uh, long days. Now, gibberellins also stimulate the breakdown of uh, starch in germinating cereal grains. And this has got some interesting uh, opportunities for use as well. And in some flowers, it introduces maleness in plants that have separate male and female flowers, that is, dioecious plants that have dioecious flowers. And so gibberellins play a role in sex expression. Um, gibberellins also play a role in breaking the uh, seed dormancy in some plants and allowing the seeds to germinate. Uh, gibberellins can also delay senescence in leaves and in uh, some citru citrus fruits. And in fact, gibberellins can cause seedless fruit development. Now, anybody who has ever eaten uh, seedless grapes will, have, uh, will know about seedless fruit development. And this is caused, uh, and this is induced by spraying the grapes with, uh, um, with gibberellins so that they develop without seeds. Now let's move on and look at abscisic acid. Uh, abscisic acid is often thought of as a stress-mediating hormone, although it has other roles as well. In particular, it mediates the stress responses in uh, seeds, in buds, and in the leaves, and by affecting the overall metabolism of the plant as well. Now, abscisic acid is responsible for dormancy in uh, plant seeds because it can inhibit, inhibit uh, cell growth and inhibit germination within the seeds. Uh, abscisic acid is responsible for dormancy in buds as well and in particular it mediates the conversion of apical uh, meristems that is the growing tips of shoots into a dormant bud for example during a cold season or other harsh seasonal conditions, like for example right now on the high felt in Gauteng, it's cold and it's dry and many plants have gone dormant. In the leaves, abscisic acid is responsible for the closure of the stomata and water stress therefore brings about an increase in abscisic acid synthesis and this reduces water loss from the leaves. Now if we look at uh, the things that affect the closing of the stomata, you'll see that abscisic acid is one of those, and 
that if you look at the things that bring about the opening of the stomata, you can see that oxen uh, plays a role in the opening of the stomata. So there is thus an antagonistic relationship between the two hormone groups, between abscisic acid and oxen, uh, oxens, in terms of their effect on the opening and closing of the stomata. Abscisic acid has overall metabolic effects as well. In particular, it can reduce uh, plant metabolism to prevent damage during periods of stress. Um, it uh, it, it uh, reduces the activity of enzymes that are needed for photosynthesis, for example, and it may turn on the expression of genes um, that uh, code for proteins that protect cells. And right now, as I'm recording this, as I've said, the high felt is cold and dry. So one can imagine uh, this effect being active in a lot of our native high felt plants. So we have covered the three main groups of hormones that you need to know about for grade tw for the grade 12 cu curriculum: uh, auxins, uh, gibberellins, and abscisic acid. <clears throat> And so we've pretty much covered what you need to know for the South African uh, syllabus on the subject of plant hormones. If you want to take it further, which I hope you do, you could visit the local library and read up on plant hormones there. Uh, you could search Google or another search engine using terms like plant hormones, auxins, gibberellins, abscisic acid, ethylene, cytokinins, etc., uh, and find some interesting material there. You can also look at videos on this and, and related subjects on YouTube or on other sources of video material. And remember, if you find something good, put it on the wiki so everybody can share in it. And I'm Derek Keats, and this resource is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution License. Bye for now.